I have the power. Pow nine. Pow power nine. Meet Mumra. Yes, Mumra. Yeah, I, I know, I know. It's the wrong franchise, but really that joke's clever on so many levels because, well, this is Power PC. I mean, remember the Power Mac G5? This is the Power 9 from IBM. It's not x86, it's a completely different microarchitecture. But the Power 9 has been completely transformed by Raptor Computing into the freest, openest, actually usable desktop computer that you can get right now, pretty much. This is the Talos 2. It really is, I think, the freest computer that I've ever used. And probably one of the most secure. There's no closed management engine as with Intel platform security, like the platform security thing or AMD's, you know, uh, well, Intel's management engine or AMD's platform security processor. And a company that built it, Raptor Computing. Well, I mean, Raptors, what's, what's not to love about Raptors? Yeah, this is the computer for people that have read and understood the full gravity of Ken Thompson's paper, uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust, which, by the way, if you haven't seen that paper or read it, you should definitely go read it now and then marvel at the fact that it was written in 1984. It's uh, completely open. The schematics, the firmware, socketed, everything. Everything is yours to download and modify however you see fit. Now I mentioned Power9, that's still an IBM CPU. IBM will license you the full designs and specs if you want. You can open it, inspect it, take a look at it, and make sure IBM hasn't snuck anything in there. Raptor Computing, the makers of the Talos 2, uh, and the members of the Open Power Foundation have done just that with the IBM Power9 CPU. I mean, it's used in a lot of government applications by governments across the world, so that's had a lot of eyes on it. All modern desktop computers are, you know, a computer within a computer. I mean, look, all computers are computers within a computer. So look, I've got my my Dell here, my trusty Dell workstation. Yeah, it's a little old, but it works for this demonstration. I've plugged in power. Literally the only thing going on here is power. Look at that, you see those green blinky lights? The green blinky lights of, uh, of evil? Yeah, it just phoned home to Skynet. That's what it's doing. Look, the front, there's no power light. There's no indication that anything is on here. The fans aren't spinning. That is the remote management platform built into this relatively ordinary Dell machine from a long time ago. There's a binary blob from Intel that runs that, and it's had security issues in the past. It's had uh, four alarm and five alarm security issues where system administrators have had to, you know, endure a fire drill where they update all their machines across the enterprise because some vulnerability was discovered in that management engine that would let the bad guys take over their computers. And this is taking over at a very, very low level below the operating system in the management firmware with, you know, a paper like reflections on trusting trust, the bad guys could get in here and you would be really hard pressed to get them out. It's, a, it's what a lot of governments are afraid of, but you know, in terms of like nation state warfare, in terms of like one country wanting to mess with another country's citizens, because that's the world we live in now, uh, that should scare you because that's a very real possibility, a very real computing possibility uh, if there's a, a flaw in the underlying firmware. Now pretty much all modern computers have that computer within a computer for management and remote control and Believe it or not, a lot of enterprise customers actually want that. If somebody screws up their operating system, how are you gonna reinstall it remotely? You can do those kinds of things in the enterprise. Even if you've got a motherboard that uh, doesn't have like the Intel V Pro feature, the features are still there in the firmware. So you never know. And I mean, Intel's security track record is at best remedial at this point. So the code for things like initializing the system bus and handshaking with the memory, Etc. I mean, if you're a tinkerer and you've gone into the BIOS for your UEFI, that code that makes the network light come on lives even below that. And that's how you go from power on to actually getting into the UEFI to do stuff. Uh, that software at a very low level bridges the gap. Are you sure that your firmware does not contain a backdoor? Well, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, remembering the, the lessons from Reflections on Trusting Trust is, it's hard to be sure. So everything is on GitHub from Raptor Computing. 
you can inspect it, you can kick the tires, you can look at it and try before you buy. At least that's the philosophy here. With the Talos 2, it is actually possible to verify just about all the parts of the computer are as intended, including that low-level firmware. You can even create and cryptographically sign your own. The point of these computers from Raptor Computing is that you can be secure. And our particular system here is a dual socket thing. I mean, the second biggest selling point past the security aspect is that this is a powerful Linux workstation. It genuinely is a powerful computer. Our config here is a relatively weak sauce dual four core, but Pharonix has got full benchmarks all the way up to 22 cores per socket if you wanna check those out. That is a really high performance workstation. So what do you wanna do if you've got this machine and you wanna get it up and running quick? I mean, it's an unassuming black box, you'd think, right? But no, you have gotta go through the wiki and uh, I can kind of quickly walk you through it, but you're in for an adventure. The first step is to change the BMC password. That's the baseband management controller. That's kind of like the PSP and the Intel management engine, but it's more open and flexible and you can get to it through SSH or serial. That gives you a nuts, that gives you a remote shell to manage the machine, to power it on, to do stuff with it. Now, the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do when you get into the BMC is change the password to something secure. So you don't wanna plug this into an insecure network. You wanna use a crossover network cable to another machine that you trust, and this locking it down, uh, locks it down at a low level so that you, know, you can verify the firmware and make sure somebody doesn't do something bad. Next, you can decide if you wanna use the onboard VGA or the onboard serial port for your console. My system was defaulted to the serial port, which took me some time to figure out, and I'd suggest you keep it that way, as a lot of the, the PowerPC 64 LE installers for uh, you know various distros seem to really expect you to be installing over that serial port and not VGA, so that's fine. Once you do that, you're gonna to need to plug the system into a trusted network and connect via SSH to OpenBMC with the default password and set the password. So it's critical that you don't plug the system into an untrusted network, like I was saying, because somebody else might see your system and connect to it and that kind of thing. I mean, probably not, but it never hurts. I mean, if you're, if you're buying this machine for that level of paranoia, just so you know. Installing the OS can be tricky as well, at least with my experience. Uh, I, I had the best luck with Fedora and Red Hat slash CentOS. I mean, Power9, IBM, the IBM acquisition, go figure. Second best luck, Debian. It's also possible to install Alpine and a lot of other distros if you're into that kind of thing. Basically anything supporting PPC 64 LE, but with varying levels of adventure. Like you might have to image it and then boot off of it, or the installer might work, or the installer might be a little weird. I did have trouble accessing the onboard VGA for the purposes of installation, and I found the Red Hat server install that made use of VNC to be the most effective. Of course, the text mode installer via the serial console is also viable. You can switch to workstation, uh, a workstation install after the install is complete. So even though you're not technically using the workstation installer, you can install all the workstation stuff after the fact. And I do wanna note that the Raptor Wiki doesn't really mention anything about the actual OS installation uh, for the procedures, but it does have procedures for compiling the uh, firmware and making sure that your firmware is secure and the MD5 sum matches and, and that, that sort of thing. So you can download the source and compile your own, or you can download the pre-compiled firmware if you want. Now, as you might imagine, the computer within a computer actually has a lot of moving parts. That's normal. That's just how these computers are these, these days. So there's a lot of firmwares even beyond the firmwares that uh, Raptor Computing provides. There's add-in cards. Mine came with an AMD WX7100 graphics card from AMD. This is the same pro-level graphics card that I reviewed last year. It's the most open, high-performance GPU that you can get, pretty much. Now there are some blobs, binary large objects, so some black box code here around the boot code for the graphics card. There's also some binary blobs in the NVMe controller, so it's not totally open, but it's it's as close as you can get. And, you know, it's gonna be hard to compromise through those things. Uh, the USB ports are a little limited. I've got two USB 2 ports on the front. At the rear IO, we've got RS-232 serial, two USB 3, uh, your VGA port and two NICs. One of these is, I mean, they both are accessible by the operating system, but one of these is for the remote management. Now, you do also have a lot of PCI Express slots, so if not enough USB ports is a thing that you would complain about, you can do that through an add-in card. Like the audio, the audio is not on board, that's also in an add-in card. This, like I say, this is probably the most open and secure machine that I've ever used, so if you don't want the sound card, or if your sound card has a binary blob, just use a USB sound card, I don't know. 
Now you might be thinking, wait, what about Risk Five? Well, that's the crazy levels of openness and no IBM, sure, but I'm not really sure that the ancient evil spirits of IBM are really a thing anymore. Risk V really is attractive to a lot of people for a lot of reasons, including the open ISA. Fact is though, the performance isn't there yet on Risk V. If you want to do real work with a lot of horsepower securely, this is your system. If I've piqued your interest about power and moving away from x86 and that whole performance management thing, uh, it is a little bit of a rabbit hole, I'll, I, I've got to admit. I mean, this video is already kind of dragging on. There's a lot of great resources on the Level 1 forum, and you can learn more about the performance and the gotchas and the quirks and all the fun accoutrement that goes with Power 9. And it is still a little bit of an adventure to use as a daily driver. I can say, using the system over the last several months, that it has been an interesting and rewarding experience. Software support can be rough around the edges, but it has improved at an incredibly impressive pace. I mean, clearly they're getting these machines into the hands of the right software developers to make everything, like about everything that I would complain about has been fixed. Um, I mean, for the last six months, it was like, oh yeah, what about this? And it's like, oh, that's working now. For a while, for example, Firefox would only compile on the architecture and it, was, it ran pretty well, but Chromium recently also started working, which has a much faster JavaScript engine. Uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes seems like it's pretty much working at this point, sort of, kind of. So these machines are being used for Unreal game development and even high-end video production. So there's a lot of really cool projects that the Raptor computing folks have, have put together. This machine was the first desktop computer with PCI Express 4. Yes, Raptor computing beat AMD to the punch on PCI Express 4 on the desktop. Though, I think Raptor Computing can probably thank AMD for bringing to life PCI Express 4 SSDs. You can actually buy these on the market now. And yes, they work great in here. So, final verdict. If you value freedom, as in speech, and openness, this is a good base for a fast and powerful workstation. If this is a little bit too rich for your blood, the dual socket configuration, check out the Blackbird, also from Raptor Computing. It's a more affordable desktop class as opposed to workstation class machine, and it's still built around the power architecture. So it's actually pretty fast. You can get the eight core, for example. I think that's a pretty good desktop system. This system demonstrates that the power ISA is far from a decrepit ISA, and it's probably going to go on living forever. I mean, there's open Cappy and there's other interfaces here and the firmware chips are removable and there's just, we could, we could, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. If you want to meet, uh, meet the people or meet one of the people behind Raptor Computing or learn a little bit more about the platform, check out the video we did a couple of months ago. We did an interview with one of the Raptor Computing guys. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll get uh, do something like that again. If you're going to, uh, you really should go to the Open Power Summit this year. There's going to be an announcement. I can't tell you what. I know what, <laughs> it's sort of an open secret in the industry at this point. You should go if you're interested in the Power 9 architecture because it's gonna be bananas. But that's all I can say. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out and I'll see you later.